Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 25th of June and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 28th of June and it's been a slightly more positive week for equity markets. I think investors are slowly, slowly but surely starting to adjust ever so slightly to the shift at the end of last week um, by the Federal Reserve in terms of the potential or a tapering of asset purchases, I think, or, or bond buying. I think one of the concerns that some people had is that potentially the US could well start to raise rates in a much more aggressive fashion than perhaps they'd originally been led to believe. Ultimately, I never thought that was really likely, um, but nonetheless, I think when you get different voices calling for different things and you get a split amongst and a fairly vocal split as well on the part of FOMC members, it sort of does rather beg the question as to um, whether or not um, everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet. But ultimately, I think that sort of discussion is a positive thing. I think, you know, I think central bankers would be remiss if they weren't articulating concerns about the prospect of more persistent inflationary pressure but various comments from Jay Powell um, to lawmakers and some more dovish commentary which helped to balance the narrative from the likes of uh, James Bullard and Robert Kaplan um, I think has helped assuage a number of concerns or some concerns on the part of investors that the Fed is not about to go gung-ho when it comes to um, outlining a not so much a tightening path but um a slightly a slightly a slightly more outlining a route out of emergency measures i think is probably the best way to describe that contrast that with the bank of england this week and the narrative couldn't really be more different um yes we had andrew haldane chief economist last meeting um before he departs the passages new um, there was a broad consensus that the current level of policy um, was suitable and certainly I think that's absolutely right but there was little or no discussion whatsoever about the risks about uh, more persistent inflationary pressures and I would be much more encouraged to see a similar sort of discussion going on in the Bank of England. No one is suggesting for one moment that um, we shouldn't uh, be holding rates where they are at the moment at the current moment but that's not to say that we can't discuss a route out um, and I think the fact that the Bank of England was much more dovish and wasn't following the Fed in terms of its outlook for monetary policy to me was a little bit little bit concerning but also I think it just feeds into the narrative that the Bank of England indulges in groupthink and I think and I'm hoping that the appointment of Catherine Mann um, the ex uh, chief economist of City Group, who starts in September and replaces Gertje and Vlieger, will shift the narrative in that direction because the data certainly supports a less um, a less accommodative monetary policy. I, you know, Andy Haldane's wasn't suggesting an interest rate rise. He was talking about a 50 billion pound reduction. In the bond buying program from 150 billion pounds to 100 billion pounds you know that's not a significant move in the overall scheme of things but the bank of england's reacting as if the economy is not improving and it is and i think they need to reflect that because when they do come to move they may have to move very very quickly and that could introduce a monetary policy shock if they have to tighten too aggressively they should start to think about the timeline for a potential rate rise because certainly the markets will start thinking and start pricing that in and in fact already are so um, that's that's really what we've seen this week is slight stabilization on the part of market equity markets in general european markets have lagged but us markets have hit new record highs or more specifically the s p 500 and the nasdaq have hit new record highs um, and you can see that borne out in this chart here and again it's the line of least resistance um, very much by the dip on 
the S&P, buy the dip on the NASDAQ, um, buy when it approaches support. What's notable though, I think, is the fact that the Dow and the Russell 2000 haven't been able to hit new record highs, even if the NASDAQ and the S&P has. Now, that's not to say that we should be concerned about that because, you know, ultimately, um, eventually they tend to play catch up in any case. Um, and if you look at, say, for example, the DAX, for example, we have, we've, we've also seen a rebound, albeit nowhere near as solid. Now, I think we can now start to redraw that line because it's now looking an awful lot more messy. So we can now draw that so that it goes through there, more or less. Um, and I think that it, I think it is a little bit of a concern that European markets, for some reason, don't appear to be anywhere near as exuberant as US markets. But uh, then again, um, European policymakers, for all the noise they're making about the new fiscal stimulus plan and the recovery package, it's certainly nowhere near as comprehensive as the US one. And as for the FTSE 100, well, again, don't get me started on that. Let's just get rid of that line. Don't don't need it anymore. So we'll just remove it. But if but if we look at the way the FTSE 100 has rebounded, the the rebound hasn't been anywhere near as significant. But nonetheless, we still we're, we're still in what I would call a fairly fairly broad uptrend. Um, overall, and there's certainly no sign on my part that we can't still go back to the highs that we saw earlier in June uh, and go through them and go above them over the course of the next few sessions. So, what are we looking at as we come towards the end of the month, the end of the and 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 the end of the quarter? Well, I think my main my my main um, focus in the coming week is non-farm payrolls because I think one of the things we can take away from the narrative of the past week or so is that while the Fed is not unduly concerned about inflation and we'll see in the PCE deflator numbers later today which are likely to come in anywhere between three and a half and four percent well over double the Fed's inflation target what we took or what I took away from this week was the fact that the Fed is much more concerned about the labor market, which brings me neatly to my main focus for the upcoming week, which is non-farm payrolls, which is due out on Friday. We also have US consumer confidence, US ADP payrolls as well. So obviously we're paying particular attention to that. That'll be out on the Wednesday. Um, but I think non-farm payrolls is going to be the key indicator because I think one of the things, one of the takeaways that I took away from this week was that there was concern at the fact that the participation rate is not showing the same level of resilience. It's not rebounding um, back to the levels that we saw pre-pandemic. Just to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that pre-pandemic, the participation rate was at 63.4%. Now, we're nowhere near that. Um, we're still around about 61.6, 61.7%. And I think the Fed is concerned about the impact the pandemic has had on the labor force, where the people have permanently left it, retired early, setting up their own businesses. There is an awful lot of concern about that, but also the fact that compared to the expectations that we had in March of adding a million jobs a month, that expectation has come in quite a bit. Because if we look at this year's jobs numbers since January, we've added 166,000, 468,000 in February, 770,000 in March. That was obviously the revised down number from the 916. 278,000 in April, which was revised up from 266, and 559,000 in May. So it's it's very patchy, and I think it's likely to continue in that vein going forward. And if it does continue in that vein going forward, then it's going to take the US an awful lot longer to get back to sort of the levels of participation that we saw um, back in the early part 
of 2020. Now, the June payrolls report expectations are for a number anywhere in the region of 650,000 to 700,000. But let's not forget that was also the expectation in May and we came in well below that. Now, the unemployment rate, again, is, that, that is also expected to fall from 5.8% to 5.7%. Um, but the labour force participation rate is currently at 616 so what does that mean for the dollar? And more importantly, what does it mean for bond yields? Well, certainly US 10-year yields um, have stabilized at around about 1.5%. Um, and I think that's probably the sweet spot as far as the Fed is concerned or when it comes to the overall picture for long-term yields. I think what we need to be paying more attention to um, is US two-year yields and here we've seen a significant breakout from this level of resistance that we saw in this chart here now if i take this chart a little bit further out you can get a better idea of the extent of the breakout that we've seen um, you know you take that peak there back in june 2020 when it was about 0.22 we're now well above that so we've broken out of the range that we're in between 0.1 and 0.2%. And we're now back up at 0.27%. Now, you can argue in the scheme of things that's not a big move. But I, and nonetheless, it is still very significant because it marks a breakout of the range that we've been in for over the course of the past 12 months and suggests that US short-term rates are likely to continue to move higher towards long-term rates. So the yield curve is flattening a little bit, and that's a bit of a worry for banks more broadly. But putting that to one side, banks are being supported by a whole new different set of factors, namely the fact the Fed has is set to relax the restrictions on buybacks and dividends at the end of this month. And in their Q2 numbers, which are due out in mid-July, we could see an awful lot of money returned to shareholders. So I don't think bank, US bank shares are coming off anytime soon. Anyway, I digress. Basically, what we've seen with respect to the CMC dollar index is it rejected that 200 day moving average. And that's the area that I will bring particular attention to more broadly, because I think the debate now amongst central bankers is not so much about um, how long they can, they can keep monetary policy loose. It's basically how long will it be before some central banks start to tighten monetary policy and it could well be that the bank of england and the federal reserve will probably be first to start articulating that um, type of timeline as we head into head towards the end of the third quarter and maybe the beginning of the fourth quarter obviously variance notwithstanding so that i think that's the big debate going forward if we so, so essentially, the the the, the, main, the main the main focus for me this week will be non-farm payrolls on Friday, the second of July, which is also um, which is also Independence Day um, weekend for U.S. markets. So you might find volume a little bit thinner than normal. We've also got U.S. consumer confidence on the 30th of June, and that is likely to um, remain fairly resilient. It's jumped quite sharply in recent months coming in 117.5 um back in back in may and we could well see a little bit of an edging higher back to around about 119 120 but i, I think it's also important to remember that us fuel prices are actually rising quite sharply at the moment and that could act as a break on consumer confidence because if it costs you more to drive anywhere you're going to have less money to spend when you get there um, we've also got manufacturing PMIs um, coming coming out from France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the US, the UK and China. Um, they are still expected to remain reasonably resilient. We've seen the flash PMIs and they still look fairly strong, even if they have softened a little bit in June. Nonetheless, they still point to a decent recovery in economic activity. And then we'll have the services PMIs. The week after and one notable um, takeaway that i've taken from these um, indicators is input costs they've been rising quite sharply and at some point they will need to be passed on to consumers 
So that'll be another area that I'll be keeping an eye out for. And then we've also got first quarter GDP, final first quarter GDP from the UK. So let's look at the cable in the round because we're back below 140, which is disappointing. Uh, but nonetheless, we are still in the broader uptrend that we've been in since uh, May last year. So I'm not overly concerned um, by the fact that we've broken down below 140, which is a nice little pivot line all the way through here. Um, keeping an eye on these lows that we saw earlier this week around about 138, 137.90, and then below that you've got 136. So we're still in the broad range. I'm still of the opinion that cable's probably got more upside than downside. And this bullish candle here would suggest that if we can get through 140 and the 50 day moving average, we can head back to 142.40. Obviously, if we break below this trend line here, that rather undermines my bullish narrative. But it's ultimately wait for the what wait for the price action to tell you what the story is. Don't try and preempt it. And the story is at the moment, cable looks very much a buy the dip type of trade. It's a similar sort of story for euro dollar, though I would be slightly more cautious about buying the dip in that. Yes, we did again see a fairly bullish candle here. We struggled to make gains in the short to medium term. But given the fact that this candle here is a very, it's a bullish engulfing candle, that I would suggest that as long as we can hold above 118.70, 119.00, then we could well see a retest of 120 and potentially 120 and a half over the course of the next um, few days, um, just based on what the price action is telling me. We saw a similar sort of um, reaction take place here, albeit on a slightly delayed basis. If you, if you blend these two candles here, you've got a similarly bullish breakout there. Um, though I have to admit, we did actually accelerate quite a bit higher, much more quickly then. But as we're probably as we're coming to the end of the week, the end of the month and the end of the quarter, you may find that it takes a while for this to play out. But as long as we hold above 118.70, then we should continue to drift back towards 120. Looking at Euro Sterling getting a little bit of a squeeze back all the way to 86. And we have we have seen a little bit of a bullish reversal there, but it's in a sideways trend. So what's it reversing? OK, yeah, we have been drifting lower, but is it any different to that candle there? You know, that candle there, they're more or less the same. What we do know is there's decent buying interest in and around 85.30. And if we do break below that, then we've obviously got the lows there at 84.80. And then you've got a series of highs all the way through 86. And then you've got a series of highs through 86.40. So euro sterling is not going anywhere, albeit I do have a slight downward bias for that towards 84.80 and 84 in the short to medium term. Um, so that's um, th those. Those are the I think really the, the the main the main indices and currencies that I've got my eye on at the moment. Have a quick look at Brent crude for you because we continue to break higher. On the break above that 7250 area that I identified in various video videos over the weeks, we haven't been able to get back below it, and that leaves us on course for a move towards $80 a barrel. Um, now OPEC Plus are discussing about upping production, and certainly there will be other meetings with respect to that. It is certainly something that I think they need to look at. There's certainly spare capacity for them to do so, given the fact that output is way below the levels that it were, was pre-pandemic. So the capacity is there. It's really just a question of whether there's the appetite to release those barrels to market. Certainly, I think the last thing OPEC or OPEC Plus want is to choke off demand through higher prices. And I think that's something that Russia is probably a little bit concerned about going forward. The global recovery remains very fragile. And the last thing OPEC will want to do is kill off demand. So that's oil prices. Quick look at gold held the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of this entire up move here, trading between 1800 and 1760. Uh, it's hard to say which way this is going to break. If I was to hazard a guess, given the way the price action is trading at the moment, we could well trade back towards the 50 day and the 200 day moving average. But at the moment, Gold's, gold looks a little bit on the soft side. 
what other things am I paying attention to this week? Well, there's a couple of things. We've got earnings out from the likes of Associated British Foods, which owns the Primark um, chain of clothes shops. We've got Dixon's, Dixon's Carphone, which is going to be rebranded to Curry's um, before, by the end of the year. And then we've got a, a main stock, um, or what has become a main stock, Bed Bath and Beyond. Let's just have a quick look at Associated British Foods because UK retail should be doing an awful lot better than it actually is, given that restrictions have continued to be eased and are likely to be eased further over the course of the next few weeks. And I think one of the things that we can, I'll be looking for with respect to Associated British Foods latest numbers is a big rebound in consumer spending at Primark. We saw the company announce huge losses in that division, despite the fact that grocery, sugar, ingredients, and agriculture all saw higher revenues. The hope is that um, closed retail will see a really big bounce back in terms of pent up demand when they release their third quarter numbers on the 1st of July. So keep an eye on that 200 day moving average in the series of lows through there. We could well see a decent upward surprise on those numbers. Dixon's car phone, electronics, PC world and what have you. Well, look at that. That's a nice little uptrend currently playing out. So I think the bar is probably pretty low. And one of the things that I have noticed with respect to Dixon's car phone, you can read about it um, on the news and analysis section of the website, which is here, right there under insights. That's where all the commentary goes. Um, and will po be posted there um, on Friday evening, Friday afternoon. We've found support with the 200 day moving average. We've got trend line support coming in through here. It, you know, the stars appear to be lining up as long as we don't break below here for a fairly decent rebound in the soon to be Curry's PLC. Um, finishing off with Bed Bath and Beyond, that's joined the meme stock. Um, it's joined the meme stock category only recently. And earlier this month, Bank of America, along with a number of other brokers, withdrew its rating on Bed Bath & Beyond, making the admission it was no longer trading in line with its fundamentals. Well, who knew? I can think of a number of candidates that could fit that description, Tesla and Uber being obvious examples, obviously GameStop, AMC Entertainment and what have you. Nonetheless, they're reporting their first quarter numbers on the 30th of June. So, um, sign up for the non-farm payrolls webinar on the 2nd of July. You can find that in the education section of the website. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets and have a great weekend.